you continue beyond 2002, beyond 2004, and what were some of the positions that you held subsequently? And talk to me about where your career ended and when, if you would. Well, after uh, my position as a battalion commander, uh, I became aide de camp of the General Chief of Staff, uh, Lieutenant General Bogi Ayalon. Uh, it took me all the way from the field uh, to the general uh, staff, uh, government. Well, what are some of the complexities of holding that position as opposed to being in the field? You're now essentially the right hand of the chief of staff for the Israel Defense Forces. Can you educate me about some of the specific distinctions that you had to really get used to and become accustomed to in that capacity? Well, first of all, it's a completely different uh, position. Uh, you have to deal with all the generals. You have to deal with the office of the Minister of Defense. You have to deal with the office uh, of the Prime Minister of Israel. The intelligence offices, I of assume, course, as well. Um, I used to go every morning. I would arrive at uh, half past five in the morning to the office, read all the intelligence uh, that came in uh, during the day and the night, um, being informed about all the operations and everything that happened. Uh, sometimes in the middle of the night deciding uh, whether I have to wake up uh, Lieutenant General or not. Sometimes taking decisions for him, uh, knowing that uh, I'll have to explain in the morning why <laughs> I took the decisions and so didn't wake him up. You'd be very sure of your decisions before yes, taking them. Yes, you need them. to be very sure okay. when you are asked uh, whether some uh, Air Force planes need to be sent somewhere in the middle of the night or not. And you're making these decisions in this capacity as aide de camp. Now, how old are you at that time? I was uh, 35 years old. That is a tremendous amount of responsibility that I think, frankly, most people go a lifetime without ever encountering. So you're making all of these decisions. By the way, what's the bigger decision, letting the chief of staff sleep or waking him up? Well, waking him, up, waking him up is a big decision, and, and I think that uh, during the time I was in this position, I woke him up, I think, only once. Okay, so we'll see whether you're at liberty to talk about that particular decision, but tell me, what was he like? What was he like to work for? How approachable, how personable was he? Well, uh, Lieutenant General Lebogi Elon is a very, very special person, very honest, very sharp very courageous. Uh, I've seen him uh, taking decisions, uh, harsh, very, very difficult decisions, uh, that very few people uh, would have the courage to take. Uh, I, I consider myself as a pers person who is not afraid to take decisions, but when I si sat beside him and saw him taking decisions, I asked myself uh, several times whether I would have the courage to to take the same decisions. Do you think that being there with him at the age that you were impacted on your decision-making ability? Do you think that that's something that he mentored you on? Or was that there innately within you? Yeah, it had a great impact on me. And so he mentored you in a number of different ways, including how to take decisions, how to manage situations and so forth. And are you able to speak about the one occasion that you woke him up? Uh, well, actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's mainly special operations uh, issues. Okay. But you're looking at these intelligence briefings, and you mentioned earlier they're coming in on a daily basis. How often are you having to review intelligence sources, points of information, and so forth? Uh, and how much of that goes directly to the chief of staff thereafter from you? First of all, it depends who is the chief of staff. Uh, Lieutenant General Bogi Eloni, he, he was uh, really passionate about intelligence. He wanted to read intelligence all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted the source, really, not somebody telling him what he thinks about uh, the intelligence. He mm -hmm. wanted to know really what exactly was the information that came. So throughout the day, he would read the uh, different uh, intelligent messages that uh, were sent. And it's ongoing. It's 24-7 all the time. New information that needs to be assessed, sometimes very fast. Mm -hmm. 
And this is all uh, while commanding the whole army and uh, meeting with uh, different uh, armies around the world and commanding operations and special operations. Uh, it's, it's a very busy uh, position. And who were some of the other characters that you saw and met with in that capacity? Were there figureheads from government? Were there leaders from overseas? Can you talk about some of Well, those? it was senators, congressmen, uh, other lieutenant generals from all over the world who were really interested about Israeli know-how. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to learn from the IDF. So these people were coming into the offices of the chief of staff, not necessarily to teach, but rather to learn from the best practices here. Yes, definitely. Definitely. We, we are a very experienced army. Um, and the, the way things are being learned here, uh, ev everywhere in the world, people want to know how things are done in the IDF. Mm -hmm. What's the lessons, what's the new lessons learned, and how to use this uh, knowledge in their armies. And, and what was the rapport like between General Yalon and his counterpart from the United States or from other countries? Did it often come down to a personal rapport, whether there was a liking between the two individuals, or, or does it go beyond that, or is it a combination of the two? It's definitely a combination. Okay. And uh, Lieutenant General Yalon was a very likable person. He's funny. Mm -hmm. He has good jokes. Okay. <laughs> He's very sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was really happy to, to meet him in, uh, in every occasion. I think that one of the most special uh, events, personally, I, I had is I flew, t I flew with him to several countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in one occasion, we flew to Turkey. We visited the Turkish army. And of course, uh, we had a dinner at the ambassador's house. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was my father. That's right. So I found myself in an official dinner uh, with uh, the general chief of staff at my parents' house. Oh, that's a fabulous dynamic. Yeah, that's great. And after you concluded that position as the aide de camp, you continued to climb the ranks and you retired ultimately at the rank of brigadier general. And your last position within the Israel Defense Forces was the senior auditor of the Israel Defense Establishment. So that's the military, that's the civilian sector, and the intersection between the two. Can you outline some of your responsibilities? And, and in fact, there's an interesting context out of which that position grew. Can you give us a little bit of that context as well? Well, this is a very, very unique position. It's the only position a part, a part of the Minister of Defense that is able to see the whole Israeli defense establishment, which means the army, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Defense, and the military industries, and overview all these uh, different uh, parts of the defense establishment, and take big issues like uh, major projects. Everybody's talking about uh, the submarines now. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a major project. Uh, that uh, has been uh, dealt in the, in the army, in the Ministry of Defense, and in the industry, of course. So uh, we audited uh, major projects, uh, we audited readiness, mm -hmm. and, and we audited... Combat readiness. Combat readiness, okay. uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. So we need to think what interests the Ministry of Defense, what would be important for him and mm -hmm. for the government, and then audit. And who's the Minister of Defense at the time that you held that position? Well, two months after I was appointed uh, to this uh, position, uh, once again, General Yalon was right. uh, appointed as Minister of Defense, uh, and I was very, very pleased and uh, had the chance to work with him uh, once again. So you became the senior auditor for the Israel Defense Establishment. You're answerable to the Minister of Defense, Moshe Yalon. Now, that means by definition he's a politician, but there are a lot of people who say about him that he operates in accordance with a series of inner guidelines that are not typical of the average politician. Is that your experience with him? Yes, this is definitely my experience. I think that uh, General Yalon is a professional. He acts accord to professional uh, issues and not politic issues. And that's what guides him, that's what helps him to make his decisions at the end of the day more than political considerations. Definitely.
Yes. And, and so you continue in that capacity, ultimately you retire. In what year did you retire in, 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 uh, from the Israeli 2016. Forces? Okay, 2016. And then you... Well, actually, the retirement was at in 2017, in April 17, but uh, we have a few months of uh, vacation before we retire. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy your vacation? Very much, yes. Okay, good.